Welcome to our first video for chemistry, chapter one. Uh, this is the introduction to chemistry, because that's this class. So chemistry, by definition, is the study of the composition of matter and the, change, the changes that matter undergoes. Well, what's matter? Matter is anything that has mass and occupies space. So we could have some examples that you might see in everyday life, like a desk you might be sitting at, um, water that you drink, the glass that the water is contained in, trees, Air is matter because it is made up of gases. So there's a lot of examples, just write down one or two for the examples of matter. All living and non-living things are made up of matter. So if it takes up space and it has a mass, it's matter. If it doesn't fit those two criteria, it's not matter. So most chemistry affects all aspects of life and most natural events. We have five areas of chemistry. If you were to go into college and wanted to major in chemistry or get more into science, you'd have to pick which area you would want to focus on. So the first area is organic chemistry. This is the study of all chemicals containing carbon. So some examples which, with these examples, again, pick one to write down or shorten what I say or show you. Um, organic chemistry, first example, would be drug design. So like medicines that we take, cancer research, um, anything like that with medicine and uh, to help us get better. Those are all ways that we can use organic chemistry. Or another one is food chemistry. A lot of the artificial flavorings that we have in our food nowadays, or the way that food's processed, is a type of organic chemistry. Inorganic chemistry is the opposite, so it's the study of chemicals that doesn't, that do not contain carbon. So most things that don't contain carbon could be anything with metallurgy or working with metals, um, because metals don't have carbon, or even steel man manufacturing. That is another type of metal, but working with metals inorganic. Biochemistry is the study of processes that take place in living organisms. So a lot of plants, how do, how do different pH levels affect plants, or uh, studying medicines and what they do inside of the human body. Uh, photosynthesis, how does a plant use photosynthesis to gain energy? All of those kind of things would fit under biochemistry. Analytical chemistry is the study of the composition of matter, and a lot of, a lot of analytical chemistry like gets down to the, what, does made up, what is it made of, or can we get down to the root of the whole thing? And so forensic science, usually is analytical chemistry, um, and a lot of research too is analytical chemistry. And the last area is physical chemistry. And a lot of people think, oh, physical means like it has to do with something that you can touch. Not necessarily. Physical chemistry is the study of the mechanism, rate, and energy transfer that occurs when matter undergoes change. So mechanism, rate, and energy transfer are the three key words, so maybe circle those in your note to help you figure out what is going to be physical chemistry. And the best example I have for you on this is the chemical process steps for a chemical reaction. So what steps does the chemical reaction go to? Okay, in our packets, we're gonna have to identify the type of chemistry that the example is given by, and physical is usually the hardest one to decipher. Well, why do we study chemistry? Many different reasons, but a few would be to explain the natural world. Um, I have down here food preparation because we have come up with a way to store our food, refrigerators and freezers. They kind of do that hundreds of years ago, but we can today, thankfully. Uh, you could prepare for a career. Many professions, whether you think of it or not, actually use chemistry in their, their everyday lives. And to be an informed citizen, the choices you make affect the direction of scientific research because who you vote into political office will have an effect on what research it gets funded by the government. So for the natural world, um, this is a common example. Um, hydrangeas are the type of flower that are here. And the pH level, which we'll get to at the end of the year, of the soil depicts what color, or it chooses which color the hydrangea flowers will turn. And so a lot of gardeners like this plant because they can just change the pH of the soil around the plant and it will change it to the color that they want it to be. Preparing for a career, uh, I don't know if you knew this, but beauticians, hairstylists need to know about the chemistry of the dyes that they put on the hair. 
of their clients because you don't want to put a dye that's going to make all their hair fall out onto their onto their head because they're not going to be happy and they're not going to come back to you. Or um, and a government institution for science research is NASA is a big one. Another one is called NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or there's the Natural Science Foundation. Um, and these are just a few of what our U.S. government funds to help us with our scientific research. So how can we tie in technology and chemistry? Well, technology by definition is the means by which a society provides its members with those things needed and desired. Modern research in chemistry can lead to technologies that aim to benefit the environment, conserve and produce energy, improve human life, and expand our knowledge of the universe. So some examples of how technology has helped through chemistry to us today are plastics. Plastics used to not be used even less than 100 years ago, 50 years ago. We didn't have as many plastic containers as we do today. Solar panel, panels and other different types of green energy is affected by chemistry and medicines and cures for diseases all affected by chemistry so one example about plastic um, back even like the 1950s 1960s when they came out with ketchup Heinz always had it in a glass bottle because the ketchup the tomato plant had a acid that would eat through plastics well they came up with the plastic and so now most of our ketchup bottles are plastic when we get them or um, green energy, we see it every single day, especially when we're driving to school. Uh, turbines, wind, wind power, um, all of this kind of thing affected by chemistry. Before we got chemistry, there were scientific ways of thinking about things. Um, the popular one was called alchemy. And even though alchemy we know today is not uh, true and based in science method, um, it did develop a lot of tools and methods that we still use in our, today in our chemistry. Antoine Lavoisier is pictured here. He was really big in the Royal Society of London for the promotion of natural knowledge. Um, this was the first scientific organization to try and group together scientific findings about chemistry and the observations and experiments that were being done on the natural world to develop into what we know today as chemistry. So with chemistry and with all science, we have the scientific method. My method steps are a little bit shorter than what you might have seen, but it's this logical, systematic approach to the solution of a scientific problem. So the three steps I have are making observations, testing hypotheses, and developing theories. If you did not have enough time to write these three things down, don't worry because the next couple of slides have these as their titles. So the first step is making observations. We do this all the time. Senses that we have are used when making observations. How does it smell? How does it taste? What does it look like? Can you feel it? Is it rough or is it smooth? All of these observations that we use our senses for can then lead to questions. They help us develop the questions like, why does that happen? How can that happen? What can this be made out of? So after we come up with all these questions, we can come up with a hypothesis. A hypothesis is a proposed explanation for an observation. So you propose why the observation is what it is. Why do you see that? Um, we're going to be doing bubble lab. So you're going to say, I propose that adding this to my bubble solution will make a bigger bubble. Well, then you have to test your hypothesis. So to test it, you have to form an experiment. When we have experiments, we have testing variables, the independent and dependent variables. Independent is the variable that you change, so it's the one thing that you're going to change. And then the dependent variable is what is then observed, but it wasn't changed at the beginning. It's just what you're looking at now to see if there is an effect on the test. Sometimes scientists use models to help represent experiments, especially if they can't see it because it's so small, which is a lot of chemistry. A model is a representation of an object or event, which this is an example of chemical bonding in the models that we use for that, so we'll probably see that later on this year. After you have tested your hypotheses, then you can develop theories and scientific laws. Both theories and natural laws are based on experimentation using our scientific method. A theory is a well-tested explanation for a broad set of observations 
whereas a scientific law is a concise statement that summarizes the results of many observations and experiments. A theory can be proven wrong. A, prov a theory is not set in stone. It can be proven wrong, but we do have a lot of common theories that we hear about all the time. Uh, gravity, uh, evolution, all of these things are theories. So if other evidence comes up, they can be proven wrong. A scientific law is a statement that is set in stone. It's been tested. There's been nothing to go against it. It's there. We know it to be true for a fact. Okay? So this flow chart kind of helps you to see how that happens. So you have your observations. And after you make observations, then you form a hypothesis. Well, then after you form a hypothesis, you have to do experiments. But this is where you can go in many different directions. You could do an experiment and come up with a new hypothesis and then do another experiment. Or after so many experiments, you can come up with a theory to explain what you have seen. After you do experiments, sometimes though, you can come up with a scientific law. It is a broad, it covers a broad range of observations and experiments, not just a few. Okay, so hopefully the scientific method flowchart helps you. And I do have another video to show you that will help you explain this a little bit better. So last but not least, we will do a lot of problem solving this year in chemistry. We problem solve all the time in everyday life. What is something that you could think of that you problem solve for? Um, maybe when you're getting dressed this morning, hopefully dress code was a part of that reasoning as you were problem solving on what to wear. Um, scheduling time. High schoolers have so many things that you're committed to, whether it be your sports, your band, uh, extracurriculars like academic teams, uh, clubs, job your family, all of those things. How do you budget your time? You're gonna have to problem solve to figure that out. What are you gonna eat for lunch today? Hopefully you can problem solve and eat something for lunch. But we do problem solving all the time. Just not maybe like in the mathematical sense that you do in algebra class, okay? Um, so we will have word problems in chemistry, but they're not very different from everyday life problems. Effective problem solving always involves developing a plan and then implementing that plan. So this year when we're problem solving, we kind of set up a plan and a method of steps that you follow to solve that plan out. All right, uh, this is the end of chapter one. Uh, we are going to go ahead and work on some other things.